the investment decision and investment decision rules. The investment decision is one of the firm's basic financial decisions. In making the investment decision, financial management determines what real assets the firm should invest in. To enhance shareholders' wealth, firms invest in real assets that are capital assets. Capital assets are large in terms of cost. They're also long-lived investments. Capital assets are used in the production of goods and services over a number of years. So they're investments with multi-year cash flow streams. Firms carefully plan and evaluate expenditures on capital assets. Mistakes are difficult to correct, and because expenditures can be large, mistakes may seriously damage the firm. The process of evaluating potential investments in capital assets is called capital budgeting. The investment decision must be consistent with the goal of the firm. Basically, the firm increases shareholders' wealth by investing in real assets worth more than they cost. In discounted cash flow valuation, investments in real assets worth more than they cost have net present values greater than zero. In net present value, the value of an investment is the present value of its cash flow stream. Net present value compares the value of the investment to its cost. The difference between the value of an investment and its cost is its impact on wealth. Consequently, net present value is an absolute measure of the monetary impact of an investment on wealth. In discounted cash flow valuation, the value of a capital project is equal to the present value of its expected cash flows. To determine the present value of a project, we forecast the cash flows generated by the project over its economic life. We determine the appropriate opportunity to cost of capital, given the risk of the cash flow stream, and use the cost of capital to discount the expected cash flows, and sum the present value of the cash flows to obtain the total present value of the project. Real assets worth more than they cost also have rates of return greater than their opportunity cost of capital. Let's recall, it's the job of managers to find investments in real assets with rates of return better than shareholders can earn on their own in the financial markets. Consequently, the rates of return available to all investors in the financial markets provides a financial standard against which all alternative investments are judged. Only if the alternative investment's return exceeds the return on an investment in financial assets of comparable risk should the investment be undertaken. If the alternative investment is undertaken, the return foregone on the investment in financial assets is the opportunity cost of making the alternative investment and is called the investment's opportunity cost of capital. Valuable investments have rates of return greater than their opportunity cost of capital. So we have two equivalent criteria to identify valuable investments in real assets. From these criteria come two general decision rules. To increase wealth, we should accept all investments with net present values greater than zero. Alternatively speaking, to increase wealth, we should accept all investments with rates of return greater than their opportunity cost of capital. In a previous lecture, we developed these decision rules in the context of a single period investment. And in the context of a single period investment, these are equivalent decision rules. In this lecture, we move from concept to practice, and we'll examine decision rules commonly used in practice to evaluate multi-year capital budgeting projects. We'll discuss net present value rules, internal rate of return rules, and profitability index rules. 
These capital budgeting decision rules are called discounted cash flow rules because they're based on discounted cash flows. We'll also discuss the popular payback rules and the book rate of return rules. What investment decision rules must consider? Market values. Appropriate decision rules must estimate current market values or incorporate current market values in their calculations. Current market value reflects the market's assessment of future cash flows and their value. Expected cash flows. What we value about an investment asset are the cash flows generated by the asset over its economic life. Appropriate decision rules must forecast future cash flows and use future cash flows in their assessment of a project. Time value of money. Appropriate decision rules must consider the time value of money because cash flows over future periods do not have the same value. More current dollars have higher value than dollars more distant in the future. Appropriate decision rules must consider risk because the risk of future cash flows affect their value. Let's recall the time value of money and risk premiums are reflected in the rates of returns in the financial markets. Therefore, proper consideration of both the time value of money and risk entails the estimation of the appropriate opportunity cost of capital. The bottom line, correct investment decision rules must lead to decisions that are always consistent with maximizing shareholders' wealth. We'll evaluate each decision rule for consistency with shareholder wealth maximization and evaluate each decision rule under two decision situations. The first situation is independent projects. Projects are independent when the acceptance of a project will not affect the decisions made on other projects. Independent projects are evaluated independently of all other projects and each project is independently subjected to an accept-reject decision. The second decision situation is mutually exclusive projects. Mutually exclusive projects involve a choice among alternatives. Within a group of projects, if we accept one project, we must reject the others. For example, let's suppose we're planning to build a manufacturing facility we can either build it in Pennsylvania or North Carolina. If we build it in Pennsylvania, we must reject the North Carolina alternative. These are mutually exclusive projects. For mutually exclusive projects, we want to rank each project and pick the best project. Net present value. Net present value identifies investments worth more than they cost. Net present value is also an absolute measure of the dollar impact of an investment on wealth. As a decision rule for capital budgeting projects, it estimates the current market value of the project. It forecasts expected future cash flows and uses future cash flows in the assessment of the project. By discounting the cash flows by a market required rate of return, it takes into account the time value of money. By discounting the cash flows by an appropriate opportunity cost of capital, it's accounting for how risk affects the value of the project. The net present value decision rule is to accept all investments with net present values greater than zero. Now let's apply this concept to evaluating capital budgeting projects. When evaluating independent projects for an accept-reject decision, the net present value rule is to accept all projects with net present values greater than zero. When evaluating mutually exclusive projects, 
and mutually exclusive projects are ranked by their net present value. The net present value rule is to choose the project with the highest net present value. That is the project with the biggest positive impact on wealth. We're going to build a manufacturing facility. We'll either build it in Pennsylvania or North Carolina. The facility has an economic life of five years. If built in Pennsylvania, it'll cost $25 million. If built in North Carolina, $22 million. The two alternatives have these expected cash flows over five years. We discount the cash flows by a 15% opportunity cost of capital to get the present values of the projects. We subtract the cost of the project from its present value to get its net present value. Following the net present value decision rule for music exclusive projects, we would pick North Carolina as it has the higher net present value. The North Carolina project will increase wealth by $3.48 million. Did we make the correct decision? Well, ask yourself, what would you rather have in your bank account? $2.49 million or $3.48 million? The NPV rule made the correct decision. Now let's review how to calculate net present value in a spreadsheet. Net present value with mutually exclusive projects. A firm is planning to build a manufacturing facility. The facility has a projected life of five years. The facility can be built either in Pennsylvania or North Carolina. If built in Pennsylvania, the cost is $25 million and has expected cash flows of $8.2 million each year for five years. If built in North Carolina, the cost is $22 million and has expected cash flows of $7.6 million for five years. The opportunity cost of capital is 15%. Time zero, we have our costs. We have our expected cash flows for both projects over the next five years. Into rate, we input the 15% opportunity cost capital. We want to calculate the total present value for each project. We use Excel's MPV formula to calculate the present values of the projects. Remember that the NPV formula is misnamed. It doesn't calculate net present value, but what it does give us is the total present value of a cash flow stream. So let's go into formulas, into our financial formulas, and scroll down and select NPV. Into the dialog box, we input our 15% opportunity cost of capital into rate. I put my cursor on value one. I put my cursor on the first cash payment in the cash flow stream. Shift click on the last payment in the cash flow stream. And the entire cash flow stream is inputted into the formula. The present value for the Pennsylvania project is $27.488 million. Let me copy that and paste it into North Carolina to get the present value for the North Carolina project. The North Carolina project has a present value of $25.476 million. Unlike the time value money equation formulas in Excel, the net present value formula doesn't assign a negative or positive sign to the present value to indicate the direction of the cash flow from the decision maker's point of view. The sign on the present value is strictly from the math because we're going to add the cost of the present value to get the net present value. So to calculate net present value, let's go back to our formulas, to our math trig formulas, scroll down, and select sum. In the number one, let's put the present value of the Pennsylvania project. In number two, we'll put its cost the negative $25 million, and we get the net present value for the Pennsylvania project. 
$2.488 million. Let me copy that and paste it in North Carolina. And we get the net present value for the North Carolina project, $3.476 million. Applying the net present value rule for mutually exclusive projects, we'd pick North Carolina because it has a higher net present value and hence will have a larger increase in wealth. Net present value can be defined as the monetary impact of a project on wealth. Projects with net present values greater than zero increase wealth. Now let's consider net present value in the context of a corporation. The cash flows of a corporation are claimed by holders of the corporation's financial assets, its creditors, and its shareholders. Consequently, the value of the firm is divided between creditors and shareholders. So let's ask, how is the wealth created by a positive net present value project distributed in a corporation between its creditors and its shareholders? Consider the following firm. The firm has assets consisting of $10 million of cash and other assets with a value of $90 million. The firm has a total value of $100 million. The value of the firm is divided between its creditors and shareholders. The claim of creditors has a value of $20 million. The claim of shareholders has a value of $80 million for a total value of $100 million, the value of the firm. Now the firm undertakes a project costing $10 million with a present value of $25 million. It'll finance the project with the cash it has on hand. The project has a positive net present value of $15 million. Now let's look at the assets out of the balance sheet given the project. The firm has other assets with a value of $90 million and it has the project with a value of $25 million. The total value of the firm is now $115 million. The value of the firm increased by the $15 million net present value. So net present value can also be defined as a change in the value of the firm due to the project. A positive net present value project increased the value of the firm by the net present value. This new total value is divided between creditors and shareholders. Creditors have a prior claim to the firm's cash flows and value, but their claim to the firm's cash flows is fixed. The debt cash flow to creditors is limited to no more than a set of interest payments made periodically and a payment of principal. Given that the debt cash flows are fixed, the value of debt is also fixed. Shareholders have a residual claim to cash flow and value, but their claim is open-ended without limit. So let's calculate the value of shareholders' equity as a residual value. The total value of the firm is $115 million. The fixed value of debt is $20 million. So the remaining residual value is $95 million. Therefore, with the project, shareholders' equity increases to $95 million. It increased by $15 million by the net present value of the project. So the entire net present value of the project accrues to shareholders. The important point. In the context of a corporation, by definition, net present value is the increase in shareholders wealth resulting from the acceptance of a project. And therefore net present value rules are always consistent with maximizing shareholders wealth. So when we evaluate the other decision rules for their consistency in maximizing shareholders wealth, we compare their decisions with the decisions made by net present value rule in the decision situation. If they make the same decision as a net present value rule, then we say that their decisions are consistent with shareholder wealth maximization.
but if they make a decision different from the net present value rule, then we'll consider the decision inconsistent with shareholder wealth maximization. So let's move on to the other decision rules. Internal Rate of Return, Part 1. A valuable investment opportunity that is worth more than it costs also has a rate of return greater than its opportunity cost of capital. So in addition to the net present value rule, we have a second general investment decision rule, the rate of return rule, which is to accept all investments with rates of return greater than their opportunity costs of capital. The rate of return is the measure of performance and the opportunity cost of capital, the financial standard. The opportunity cost of capital is the market required rate of return on investments in the financial markets with the same risk as the investment opportunity. Some observations on the rate of return. Net present value is a measure of the absolute dollar impact of an investment on wealth. On the other hand, the rate of return is a relative measure of performance. It measures the dollar return per dollar of investment. We know the investment's impact on wealth when its rate of return is compared to the opportunity cost of capital. If the investment's rate of return is greater than its opportunity cost of capital, the investment has a positive impact on wealth. The rate of return is independent of the cost of capital. The rate of return is generated internally by the project itself, solely by its cash flow stream and its initial cost. Note that the cost of capital plays no part in its calculation, and so the selection of the financial standard has no effect on the project's rate of return. Given this independence, the opportunity cost of capital is a true financial standard against which the project's rate of return can be compared. Note that the rate of return is measured over a single period. So the rate of return rule is appropriate only for single period investments. So we have a problem moving from concept to practice and using a rate of return rule to evaluate capital budgeting projects. As capital budgeting projects are long live projects with multiple cash payments over multiple periods. Consider the problem in estimating a rate of return for a multi-payment, multi-period cash flow stream. If the cash payments are different in each period, the rates of return for individual periods will be different. The time value of money must always be considered, but it's particularly important for a long life project. Now there's no entirely satisfactory way of defining a true rate of return for a long life investment. But perhaps the best available concept to describe the returns of a multi-period project is an average compound rate of return over the life of the project. And this is the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return is defined mathematically. It's that discount rate that equates the present value of the project's expected cash flows with the cost of the project. Given the project's cash flows and its costs, we solve the equation for the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return is the return that's generated internally solely by the project's cash flows and its costs. So note that the cost of capital plays no part in the calculation of the internal rate of return. And so the internal rate of return is independent of the cost of capital. The internal rate of return is that discount rate that equates the present value of the cash flows with the cost of the project. But the internal rate of return can be more conveniently described as that discount rate that makes net present value equal zero. This is the net present value formula with discounting at the internal rate of return rather than the opportunity cost of capital. We solve this equation for that discount rate that makes net present value zero. 
and that's the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return decision rules. When evaluating independent projects for an accept reject decision, the internal rate of return rule is to accept all projects with an internal rate of return greater than its opportunity cost of capital. When evaluating mutually exclusive projects, the projects are ranked by their internal rates of return, and the internal rate of return rule is to choose that project with the highest internal rate of return. Let's look at a simple example. You can purchase a turbo-powered machine tool gadget for $4,000. The investment will generate $2,000 and $4,000 in cash flows for the next two years, respectively. What is the internal rate of return on this investment? The internal rate of return is that discount rate that mathematically makes net present value equal to zero, and that discount rate is 28%, and that's the project's internal rate of return. The algebraic solution requires a trial and error iteration to find the internal rate of return. We start with an initial guess, and let's try 10%. We solve the net present value equation using a 10% discount rate and get a net present value of $1,123.97. We need to decrease the net present value, so our next guess for the discount rate should be larger than 10%. We want to bracket the internal rate of return, so let's choose a much larger discount rate. Let's say 40%. At 40%, the net present value is negative. We need to increase the net present value, so our next guess should be less than 40%, but larger than 10%. Note that we bracketed the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return lies between 40% and 10%. Our trial and error guesses should progressively iterate to that discount rate that makes net present value equal zero, the internal rate of return. It's easier to do this in a spreadsheet, so let's go to a spreadsheet. Solving for an internal rate of return, you can purchase a turbo-powered machine tool gadget for $4,000. The investment will generate $2,000 and $4,000 in cash flows for two years, respectively. What is the internal rate of return on this investment? At time zero, we have a negative $4,000 cash outflow to purchase the investment. The investment generates a $2,000 cash inflow in year one and a $4,000 cash inflow in year two we're asked to find the internal rate of return on this investment. So we go to formulas, to the financial formulas, scroll down to IRR, internal rate of return. In the values, we're going to input all the cash flows, including the time zero cost of the investment. So I click on the first cash flow, shift click on the last cash flow and all the cash flows are inputted into the equation. Guess is the first guess of a discount rate in the trial and error methodology that solves for the internal rate of return. The default for the equation is 10 percent and so we don't need to put a value in the guess. Let's have the formula solve for the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return on this investment is 28 percent. An NPV profile is a graphical representation of the relationship between net present value and the discount rate. On the y-axis is net present value. On the x-axis are the discount rates. The NPV profile is a net present value calculated at progressively higher discount rates. The NPV profile also provides a graphical solution for the internal rate of return. Where the NPV profile crosses the x-axis, net present value is zero. And that discount rate by definition is the internal rate of return. 
we can see in the graph if the internal rate of return is greater than the discount rate, the net present value is positive. And if the IRR is less than the discount rate, then the net present value is negative. And that's true for NPV profiles that are declining functions of the discount rate. For most investment projects, net present value declines as the discount rate increases. And for such NPV profiles, the NPV and IRR decision rules will make the same except reject decision for independent projects. But as we'll see, atypical cash flow streams may not have net present value profiles that are strictly declining in the discount rate. And this has consequences for the internal rate of return rule.